So welcome everybody. This is our third installment of the COVID webinar series that we were calling Navigating the New Normal. Today we're really fortunate to be joined by Magdalena Luca, MCH, um, MCPHS Professor of Mathematics and Statistics. And today she's going to be talking about, I think, a very timely topic. Um, it, the, t the title of our talk is Mask or No Mask, Coffee or No Coffee, Navigating the Complicated Maze of Scientific Information really going over sort of how we can make, um, understand in you know, this information age, we're constantly being thrown out a lot of information and it's hard to sort of sift through that. And that's been particularly true in the COVID-19 pandemic. Even as an epidemiologist um, studying this and looking into it, it's, um, there's a lot out there and it's, it's sometimes things will change quite a bit. So it can be hard to sort of know the best way to make sense of all this information. So today, uh, Magdalena is going to lead us through some ways of thinking about that. Um, so like I said, this is the third installment. We don't have any of uh, the next installments currently scheduled yet, but they, there are a bunch that are in the pipeline. So I will be in touch pretty soon. So look out at your emails. And then also, um, I'm actually going to share a link in the chat. This link will be continuously updated with um, new scheduled seminars. And then also, um, the recordings of the seminar, so for example, um, just so everybody knows today's, or today's seminar will be recorded. Um, and so you can always check back there to see the recordings and also see the, the new ones that are scheduled, but there'll also be emails sent out. Magdalena has indicated that she likes sort of her presentation to be more like a conversation. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in and she'll take a look at those and, and answer them. Um, and then also if we have time, like we've done in the past, we'll have a, a, a discussion as well at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Magdalena Luca. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Devon. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, and uh, to everyone, I can see we have already 60 uh, participants. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a nice summer day. Uh, it's very hot where I am. I'm in a loft. I don't have AC. And CJ reminded me to put my fan on. So I'm hope, uh, I hope that you will find uh, my presentation useful. As everyone came in, I saw that there are a lot um, of my colleagues are here, but especially my students and uh, hello to everyone, um, colleagues, staff, students, whoever is interested. Uh, as uh, Devon mentioned, uh, I will try to stop from time to time to ask you if you have any questions, uh, but feel free to write your questions into the chat or raise your hand and Devon will help me um, get back to your questions. So I will share at this time my screen. So the title when we discuss, so as uh, Devon mentioned, uh, it took us a, uh, took me a while to discuss, uh, to decide on the title. Uh, it really has to do with scientific information, uh, but is not relevant only what we do now during COVID-19. So I added the fun part for coffee or no coffee I'm actually having a cup here. I'm not gonna drink through the, my presentation, but uh, I will end to it. So the way I structured the presentation, I would really like to start uh, discussing how we evaluate and uh, scientific information. And actually at the end, I will address the title of mask or no mask, coffee or no coffee. So uh, as I mentioned to you, I will start with um, uh, the type of sources that we can see from scholarly uh, sources to uh, peer reviewed popular sources. And I will then get into uh, a bit of details about uh, the coronaviruses one and two uh, and uh, discuss in more detail um, the issue of mask or no mask. This is slide is mostly for um, my students, uh, those who are very young. And the reason behind it is I would like you to notice that I am 54 years old and I have started, like many in the audience, we've started to uh, look into scientific information very long time ago. I've been doing this, if you look at my, um, my timeline, I graduated with my bachelor degree in 1989, that is 31 years ago. Uh, I was born in Romania, I did my undergraduate there and I moved to Canada in 92 and I pursued, I totally changed from pure math into very applied mathematics. Uh, I like very applied uh, stuff and I really enjoyed uh, the biomedical systems and I wanted to do applications in it so I did that during my masters in Winnipeg, Manitoba and I finalized my graduate de uh, degree with a um, a PhD in applied math. And if you look at what I specialized in, 
uh, it's nonlinear dynamics pattern formation mathematical modeling of biomedical systems. These are really what's behind the uh, flattening of the curve that we hear so much during uh, this pandemic, uh, how epidemiologists use these um, models. And I wanted really, uh, the reason I wanted to share this with you is to show you that it takes a very long time. As, as I will go through the presentation, it takes a very long time to be able to navigate properly the scientific information, the information that we find out there. And even when we are knowledgeable, it gets very, very complicated. Since 2002, as you can see, I've been at MCPHS and I've been teaching here for a long time. So I will start, and this is something I would like you to keep in mind for the rest of my presentation, uh, has nothing to do with sources, but I'm showing you a picture of a house I would love to hear from you, but it, if anyone there's, uh, you know, it's a nice picture. Yes, it's a house in the suburbs. Uh, nothing wrong with it, correct? Yeah, looks good. Well, this is the second part of the picture. Uh, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, you can take different pictures uh, and you can show different information. And I think this is one of m an important idea in how do we analyze sources. Uh, there's nothing fraud about this. I haven't done anything wrong. Uh, they are just two different pictures and I can show them in very different ways. You can leave out information, you can crop. It doesn't mean it's, I haven't, I didn't Photoshop it. I didn't do anything wrong with it. So keep in mind this idea of what's happening here. So in terms, uh, let's get into the nitty gritty of sources. Uh, we have in general, three types of sources, uh, scholarly sources, substantive sources, and popular sources. I will give you a few examples. Uh, in general, the credible sources are any books that you'll find in the library, uh, articles you'll find in research databases, and certain websites and search engines like Google Scholar. I emphasize a lot the idea of the library. I've seen in the audience people who are from the library. And in addition, you will see throughout the presentation, since we this is a presentation about sources, I posted here absolutely all my references. This is not usually how we do presentations, but because I want to focus on this, they are very important. How do we present references? I will have, and I will share with you sometime in the middle of the presentation, yeah, all the reference, it is in accessible form. Um, so types of information as you, as, uh, you noticed before, so they, they split into scholarly sources, substantive sources and popular ones. Scholarly are really uh, produced by uh, experts with expertise. Uh, the substantive usually is the economies, the scientific um, American, for example, they are all fact-checked, but still, they still can be read by absolutely anyone in the public. And then we have the popular sources. They are created by journalists, freelancers. I'm not too sure where the social media gets in here. Uh, I will not touch that topic today. Um, how do we evaluate them? Uh, so if you look at the um, reference that I use here at the bottom, uh, I worked a lot for uh, the presentation with Sarah uh, in the library and she helped me. She didn't know exactly uh, what it is for, but uh, this is in, on our library's uh, website. How do we evaluate sources? There are a few important ideas, six are here, that when you look at the source, you must assess the format. Is it a book, an article, a website? Uh, currency has to do with when was it published, important. Uh, is it relevant? Does it address the topic? Uh, who are the authors? They represent the authority. Uh, are they accurate? Are, is there evidence? Uh, are they reviewed or not reviewed? And the purpose is whether the information is objective. Something very interesting I would like you to note, the purpose, it's at the end. Uh, I've considered this one of very important uh, topics and I will get back to it in one of my future slices, uh, slides or slices. Um, about how to find credible websites. I'm gonna go to it because uh, 
you know, not only during a pandemic, but always, we always turn to websites. So make sure that you check domain name. The domain is always after uh, .edu. I put it in red there. In general, uh, websites such as edu, gov, and org, they are most credible because they have very strict regulations. You should be careful with the commercial ones. Check the domain name. Uh, in general, if you have questions about them or you are not sure whether it's reliable, make sure that you can verify it. Researching domains and in general, any source, it is very time consuming. It cannot be done in an instant. It's not Instagram, it's not Facebook. It takes a lot of time. And that's what, why I showed you my timeline. It takes very long time to know where to look, how to do the research, how to find this. Some sources should only be used to jumpstart your research if you are interested in it, uh, such as Wikipedia blogs and chat rooms. Wikipedia, I uh, will uh, talk a bit in more details about it because uh, nowadays, Wikipedia is one of the most used websites. Uh, I would like to, this is a huge thank you to everyone who works in the libraries. They have a huge role. Uh, I can't even emphasize enough. Uh, these are our libraries, each campus has one. Uh, the people that I have worked in the last 18 years, their names are here. There are more people working on the Boston campus. I can't thank them enough. They respond, uh, you know, in a New York minute. They are extremely resourceful. They know how to help us. If you ever need help, please refer. Uh, if you have any questions about resources, about research, they will really help you. Um, I want to get into a bit more details about the scholarly, the, sign, the really the scholarly sources, the peer reviewed uh, and um, uh, this is from our library. Uh, how is a peer? How does the peer review work? Uh, peer review are for scholarly articles. It's a very lengthy process. It takes uh, practically years from the time scientists do the research. They complete it. They write it up. Uh, they have to be peer reviewed. It's a back and forth. Uh, they are reviewed. Sometimes a journal, uh, sorry, an article can be rejected from the beginning, but otherwise can be uh, revised with feedback. Uh, only articles that, good, that meet good scientific standards will be accepted. Something very important about peer reviewed, these are practically the golden standard for how uh, scholarly work should be done. Uh, and it is relevant because of the pandemic, uh, and I will come back to it, because we have very little time since the pandemic started. Many studies nowadays, they, are, they did not have the time to be peer reviewed. So they fall into the academic source, the academic articles. It doesn't mean they are incorrect, but they do not have the time to be assessed in this form. Um, how we evaluate them? Uh, I always share this with my students. And every time I read, any peer review study. Uh, this is the order that I personally assess them. The, it is linked to how sources are evaluated. And I, the most important part that where I start, it's always the funding, the small print, like we have it in credit cards. At the end, very small print. I'm not too sure who reads them. I find this part to be absolutely crucial to any study in assessing it. Who's funding it, who's supporting it, who are the authors. This falls under the purpose that was uh, uh, last mentioned in how we evaluate sources, and it has to do with the authority. Uh, why is that important? I will have three examples for you, and you will see immediately why is this important. The next item I will always check in a study is the sample size. Is it big? Is it two people? Is it 1,000 people, 600? What is the length of a study? Two days, five days, uh, two years, 10 years, they make a huge difference. And the final item that is, of course, there are very many, I will not get into the statistics. I try to, I really wanted this here to discuss uh, presentation and how we assess science. I will not get into the, the statistics. These are all practically, they, the last three here, they have to do with statistics. The last one is, are confounding factor addressed? And I wanted to uh, mention 
one important issue here that's also related to the currency. When is a study published? I would like to note that in the last decade, the last 10 years, the statistical method that assess confounding factors have improved dramatically. So if you look at peer review studies done 30 years ago, there might be some issue, depends on the study. I'm not saying that if a study is 30 years old or 20 years old is not good, but depending on what is studied, you have to be very careful where confounding factors were addressed. Confounding factors are in short, the, the definition is that are the factors, con, the word confounding comes from confusion. Uh, are there variables that can confuse the outcome of a study? So for example, if you study Lipitor, is really Lipitor lowering our cholesterol or is our cholesterol lower because uh, we went to the gym, we changed our diet and so on. So confounding factors can have a huge impact on the result of a study. So I would like to share a few peer reviewed sources with you. Uh, some things that you might want to look in the future and in analyzing them. Uh, I have a paper here, I did share this with you. This is the abstract, uh, it might be very small for you to see it. Uh, I will, I have some uh, pieces that will zoom in. So uh, it took me a while to pick, I really wanted to choose something that was funded by, you will see if you look at the funding, it was funded by Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola in the last 10 years um, funded a lot of studies that uh, they try to show that uh, there's absolutely no correlation or cause uh, from drinking uh, soda in general. The problem is that we do not exercise a lot. So when you look at this study and the, the, the cover, the the first page, uh, it is disclosed. This is a, a new study, it was published in uh, 2015. So many uh, journal articles require this information. And if you look at the funding agency was done by Coca-Cola, and if you look at their conclusion, the correlation here is only between exercise, sleep duration, and TV viewing. A few uh, important things that you might not be able to read. The sample size was very large, 6,000. Uh, uh, kids, uh, the collection data, they collected data over a period of 10 days. Uh, did they address confounders? Yes, but they included only three of them. So such studies from the beginning, I am personally interested to read them in detail to understand even more about the problems. Personally, because it was funded by Coca-Cola, I have very serious, uh, I, I see serious bias in the conclusion and I will take this, I'd be very skeptical to really uh, use it in other settings. Before I go to the next article, anyone has any questions? Okay, so the next one, this one is a good one. I wanted to mention in my, in my previous slide, please note the uh, journals are very differently set up. Uh, this is uh, the journal is obesity here. The funding was at the on the first page. Most journal articles will have the information about um, funding and authors, so the accuracy and the purpose of a study right at the end after the conclusion. So you might want to uh, flip at to the end. Uh, in this case, the funding was very different. Uh, this is an article that uh, I will actually use a bit later in my presentation. So be careful where you find them and uh, they are important to read through them. So the last article that I would like to share with you is the famous 1998 Wakefield paper. And I wanted to share this with you because I, th I know many of my colleagues do share it. Uh, this, let me open everything. So this was published in the Lancet, as probably everyone knows, uh, you know, journals are, are ranked also. Uh, the Lancet is one of the top medical journals in the world. Uh, this was published in 98. Uh, if you analyze anything about how you evaluate the, the article, there aren't very many things that would say, Ooh, there was a problem with the funding, we don't have conf founders. The sample size is indeed very small. There were only 12 uh, children included here. Uh, the, as you probably know, this is the paper that uh, started, uh, it's considered actually for us uh, living in this, uh, during these times, it is considered the beginning of the 
of a very strong anti-vax movement. Uh, anti-vax movement, actually, I looked it up, started long time ago with the smallpox uh, issue in 1800. But for us, uh, the Wakefield paper is the seed for the anti-vax movement. Uh, so this was retracted uh, many years after it was published. It took them 12 years. Uh, the story um, was really investigated by a journalist in the, uh, the British journalist. And the findings, if you look at this paper, and this is why it is so hard to evaluate sources, uh, when you read it, there are some flags, but there are flags usually for not for those who just want to look, are there any problems with funding? Maybe with sample size, but you really have to be able to replicate the study. And uh, this is something that was done immediately. Uh, the issues that were found later with the paper are as follows. So they claim that there could be some uh, predisposition um, and a connection between the MMR and autism. And I'm not gonna read everything here, but there were from the beginning issues. So scientists noticed a small sample size, uncontrolled design, and a very speculative nature of conclusions. And within one year of publication, very quickly, if you look at the bottom of my slide, uh, there, were, there are actually hundreds of papers that were published since 1998 that found no link between the MMR vaccination and autism. Uh, in 99, there was one in Lancet. Uh, the, uh, the 2002 uh, article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine was a study done for many years uh, that follows 600,000 uh, children in Denmark. And Denmark has a very good track of collecting data and uh, being very accurate with it. So it uh, was not very easy uh, even though they showed that there's no link between the vaccination and autism, was very difficult to go back and see what's happening. Uh, now, the investigations that the UK, the British General Medical Council uh, revealed were extremely disturbing. Uh, there were a lot of financial interests that the researchers had. There were ethical violations. Uh, including uh, invasive investigations on the children, uh, deliberate fraud, uh, stuff that absolutely nobody can see when you read the actual paper. So that is a huge problem. Uh, and in 2010, uh, Wakefield was um, lost his uh, medical registration. Uh, as you probably know, he lives uh, now in the United States of America. So I wanted to share with you a few peer review uh, studies. Um, and some of the issues that you might find even in these. Uh, another uh, uh, scholarly um, work source are the academic articles. So there are differences between them. This is very relevant nowadays because most of the articles that came out uh, in the last few months, uh, they are really academic articles. They are still uh, research focused, written by uh, authoritative authors. Um, however, there's not all of them were peer reviewed. The peer review takes a very long time. You're probably aware that some of the papers were uh, actually retracted. And I have here a link that there were uh, some retractions even in the Lancet, in the New England Journal of Medicine about uh, COVID-19 studies. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to move on to popular sources. I left out the, the ones in the middle, the substantive ones, because these are very often some sources that uh, many of us turn to when we want to do any search. I will not read this. This I shared. This uh, uh, I found on the MCPHS libraries. Our students have to take some modules to be able to graduate. And this is part of the intro to research essentials. So you have to be very careful. They have very good um, hints here what to do when you look up popular sources. Um, I'm gonna turn to Wikipedia. And the reason why I want to turn to Wikipedia is twofold. One is because uh, a lot of us actually use Wikipedia, uh, but for uh, really scholarly work, it should only be used to jumpstart a research. Uh, 
why there are issues with Wikipedia is because it is an open source. It can be edited by any time, uh, by anyone at any time. Uh, it, um, it can have information on the page can have issues. And uh, the references are important. They usually are secondary sources. They rely on the primary ones. Something very important is who are the editors? So articles on Wikipedia are only as good as the editors are. That means there are very different editors who work on Wikipedia. There are people who really enjoy this. There are also uh, academics who work on them and it really depends on their education, on their uh, background and their efforts uh, put into the article. Uh, Wikipedia in general uh, has a set, it's a, it's a non-profit organization, has a set of policies of quality control, especially articles under the Wiki project. This is a special project that I have worked on and uh, I would like to share with you uh, because I had I, I did this twice. I'm actually currently working on a uh, on a training project, and I worked on two. And I can't even tell you how much I enjoy this work. Uh, you would never know who wrote an article. Uh, people tend to have uh, very different names, and it has to do with um, harassment. They can be they can be very bad. There are a lot of fights behind Wikipedia, how people write these um, articles, so you will not recognize my name, uh, whether I wrote it or not. And I did one in 2018, and we wanted to improve uh, pages of women in science. Uh, everyone who worked on them were academics or researchers, and the facilitator was again a librarian, and uh, the same facilitator is now doing a Wikipedia scholar uh, that we are, I'm currently working on. These are pages that uh, want to improve information about COVID-19 at the state and regional uh, phase. So uh, personally, I work in, uh, to improve the page of New Hampshire because it's very, uh, has very little information. Best page on COVID-19, guess who? Massachusetts, of course. Uh, so I'm, I'm not working on that one, it's enough information. So we're trying to improve pages that don't have very good information. The wiki pages, the wiki uh, education, these kind of projects, they really try to work with academics and researchers. Uh, they really focus on improving uh, scholarly content and references. We are, uh, we are trained to, uh, be careful with references that we use, with pictures. It's uh, extremely, uh, uh, the rules are very strict. I cannot write, for example, about my research, my colleagues. I, I would not be allowed to write a wiki page about my supervisor, about myself, my family, and the references really have to be uh, excellent. Uh, Wikipedia has, if you are familiar with the page, there are different places when you can uh, click uh, there are roughly 6 million pages on Wikipedia. They do have a content assessment, how they are uh, assessed each article. You can look it up under a tab called talk. Uh, we are asked to really improve. Uh, if you look at uh, the articles, we are asked to really improve articles that are stubs or starts so that uh, uh, we can put more information on COVID-19 right now. And they are also ranked by how important they are. Uh, the last item uh, is how I improved. In 2018, I improved one of the pages uh, for a, a woman in, uh, met uh, in, she's an astrophysicist, uh, and this was the original page, and uh, believe it or not, to get here, this is the, how it went, uh, how, uh, how it looked like after I worked for six weeks on it, uh, just improving a few paragraphs, takes very long time and I want to emphasize enough again how important it is that you take your time and it takes a very long time to know how to find uh, good resources and improvements. Uh, my last one, I just received an email yesterday. This is in the reference page. If anyone is interested, please note, uh, I, have, I received absolutely no funding for this. Uh, because uh, I'm in a wiki education program, uh, we are asked to share this information. Uh, they are looking for uh, people who are interested in improving pages. 
uh, they have upcoming uh, courses on Wikidata and a Wiki special course for the 2020 elections. So I will share uh, this information with you uh, probably once I finish my presentation, I have a PDF and I will share that with you. So more popular sources, uh, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna switch a bit to newspapers. There are so many nowadays uh, and you, we have to be very careful how we read them. And I have one example, there are many. Uh, this is an article that appeared in the New York Times in 2018 on uh, Anahad O'Connor is their main health and um, um, consumer writer. He writes excellent articles. This one was though a miss. If you look at the title, uh, of the article that appeared in New York Times. I, I really, if any of my students are here, this was part of a actually directed study and uh, it really bothered me immensely how they are presented. And this, we, we, we can see this in newspapers all the time. The titles are very catchy. They really are interested in ranking. Uh, in this case, if the original article was uh, in JAMA and while they did address uh, quality of um, of foods. The title does not even come close to what the conclusion of this article was. So we have to be very careful how we read these articles. What is good is that very often in good newspapers, you will always find uh, a link to the original study. And I would like to, that's something to encourage uh, everyone. If you are really interested, how to evaluate the source. If you find articles actually anywhere, uh, newspapers, uh, social media, if you look hard enough, you will find the original source. If you don't, then th that means that there are some other uh, serious issues. So uh, this can happen often, um, unfortunately. So please pay uh, good attention to how you can find the actual original sources. Uh, I actually talked here about the conclusion of the study and in, uh, they don't even mention in any way uh, what the title of the uh, New York Times article uh, mentions. Um, so finally, let's go back to, we're getting closer to mask or no mask, to the title and to, to coronavirus. I was very interested when I looked at the uh, uh, cough to, I was very interested to see how does it compare to the actual, the first one. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 uh, uh, appeared in 2002 um, and it actually infected only 8,000 people. Um, I shouldn't say only, uh, I, sorry, I take that back. Um, and uh, 774 people died roughly, uh, very few in the, uh, nobody in the US. Uh, that's a very, big difference in what happens with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, as of July 19th, uh, using uh, information on the John Hopkins, you see it at the bottom, uh, we are actually very close to 15 million people infected and uh, 607,000 people have died worldwide. Um, so what happens, why is such a big difference between the two viruses? Uh, COV-1 was more aggressive and lethal. And the main difference between the two, I know this is, uh, I'm getting into uh, the biology of it. Uh, um, Crystal Alice had the, the amazing uh, first talk in this series and she talked in detail about the virus, uh, but I just wanted to touch base about uh, some issues that I wanted to relate to the mask. And the reason why, uh, the difference between the two viruses is the contact tracing. And it has to do with the uh, fact that severe symptoms in COV-1 developed very quickly, whereas uh, in SARS-CoV-2, uh, the symptoms um, develop really much later. As I said, uh, SARS-CoV-1 really burned down by 2004. There are still a few cases here and there, but it is not, uh, doesn't even compare to what's happening now in our pandemic. Uh, anything uh, that I wanted to mention about SARS-CoV-2 is that how we get infected. Uh, and the Scientific American, which is a substantive source, had a very interesting slide. I do have the reference at the bottom, uh, really explains how our immune system responds to it. Uh, the innate one responds within zero to three days, and then the adaptive one in six to 11 days. 
uh, the virus is very effective at preventing uh, infected cells to send signals. And uh, the, my last point there is that the viral load really peaks just before people show symptoms. And people show symptoms generally very late, not within one to two days as it happened with SARS-CoV-1. Um, there are some reasons why this is happening. Uh, the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is on, uh, much longer than others. I will have a, a slide uh, immediately. It is uh, approximately 29,000 base pairs. Um, and uh, this helps SARS-CoV-2 to be very versatile at correcting its copies. If you look how SARS-CoV-2 compares to other viruses, uh, this is the genome length for other ones. HIV is roughly around 8,000. Uh, the flu, one is around 13,000. Ebola comes close to 20, but SARS-CoV-2 is very long. And because it's roughly 30,000, this is why it is so versatile at um, correcting its copies. So these are the, I would like to mention now that I put this out here, something very important. The last, the, this ways of transmission is information that we know today that I've been able to access by July 20th, this information changed dramatically. As you probably know, the WHO only last week uh, put a new note that SARS-CoV-2 uh, has the possibility to be transmitted uh, airborne. So this information changes. You see this, in, this uh, presentation today, probably in one month, we're gonna know a lot more. And this is very important to know it's what we know so far. I want to make sure that everyone understands this. Um, so finally, we're almost at the end. Uh, mask or no mask? I'm not gonna ask anyone. Uh, I'm gonna say that it really depends on the source. Uh, I'm not gonna comment at all about it, but the CDC and WHO definitely encourages everyone to use one. Uh, the movie pandemic that did not. Uh, I will have clearly not, not I, I'm not gonna discuss the no. Uh, I personally use it all the time and I think we should all use it all the time. Uh, why is that? Uh, again, the information on this slide, it's based on what we know so far. Uh, we should always use it indoors. Of course, I don't use it now. We don't use it in our house. Uh, outdoor, uh, it is required when social distancing of at least six feet is not possible or when certain signs require them. And I will have a slide about that one. Uh, why? Uh, originally, uh, people thought that uh, it really protects those who are infected from spreading it, especially when we are asymptomatic. Uh, as we know so far, the information that we know so far is that SARS-CoV-2 uh, has a very long time of uh, being asymptomatic. And people who are asymptomatic uh, really, as I mentioned before, the highest viral r r uh, load appears right before we're symptomatic. And there are very many people who will never show actually as any symptoms. That doesn't mean they don't spread it. So the mask will protect those who are infected from spreading it. There's a bit more evidence nowadays, and this is why they recommend the mask all the time, is that even uh, the mask protects even the person that wears it from droplets that can remain suspended in the air. Uh, the less in general uh, we are exposed to the virus, the better. And this is linked to the fact that so many doctors and healthcare workers have lost their lives during this pandemic because they were exposed to a very high load of the virus. Um, so this is something that the WHO shows how to wear. I'm not gonna go into chin on, chin under, you know, all the issues with mask. I think everyone, I hope knows how to wear it all the time, not to touch it, to wash hands before. Um, what we shouldn't do that, you know, it just because it's under your nose, uh, it has to be properly used uh, and uh, the, 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 the uh, they are here that it, they have to cover your nose, your mouth, uh, the tighter, the better. 
um, and if they are loose, they will not help us a lot. So some excellent sources uh, that I use for this presentation where you can continue to um, find uh, information. I'm using the John Hopkins, the CDC, WHO. I did want to share with you a very short three minute uh, YouTube on presented by NPR. Uh, what happens when you exercise? Uh, these are uh, times when we actually, if we are infected, we spread a lot. And uh, it, it's a very nice one. The National Geographic this week came up with uh, a poll who wears, who doesn't wear. I'm not going to get into one. If you're interested, you'll be able to access this link. Uh, but I wanted to share, and I mentioned to you that even outdoors, there are places that require a mask. So my husband and I love to roll a blade. We're coming from the West Coast. I've done that for 25 years. And we are using the Minuteman bikeway. It's a 10 mile long uh, way, a bikeway. Uh, people can walk, bike or roller blade. It is pretty narrow, uh, around 10 feet. And if you see the signs, masks are required. Uh, this is me, I do have my mask. Uh, and there are some places, this is not a beach where you can, we can be 50 feet apart. Um, there are a lot of people on the bikeway that do not wear the mask. Uh, and um, it's sometimes problematic to be on it. But yes, there are places even outdoors that require us to wear the mask. So for the fun part, I have only two more slides. Coffee or no coffee, this is just for us to um, probably end on a more happy note. Uh, most people say, and I chose for you sources that are really scholarly uh, sources. Most people say yes. Uh, how much is beneficial? Three to four cups a day. And we should definitely refrain from drinking uh, caffeine before uh, six hours before bedtime. Uh, there are a lot of articles in popular sources where people claim that, oh, I had five espressos at 10 p.m., I sleep like a log. That is actually scientifically proven is not the case. Even if we fall asleep, uh, we do not have a good sleep. We wake up very often without knowing that uh, the sleep is actually very disturbed. And these are the benefits that uh, we can have from coffee uh, if, it's, um, if we use it uh, the right way. But sometimes it can be harmful. Uh, it always increases heart rate at the beginning, uh, can increase anxiety, sleep disturbances, can have side effects, serious side effects uh, in pregnant women and in women with high risk of fracture. Uh, to end uh, the coffee discussion, uh, do I like coffee? Uh, you're gonna judge. So that's um, clearly I do like coffee. Um, and my last slide, uh, gonna link to my first one uh, about timeline, uh, that it takes a very long time to get good to it. We have to be very patient, especially in this pandemic. And I thought about it, you know, IT statistics, I, I would love the correlation here, the coefficient of correlation to be one, that ideally as we get older, we should gain more knowledge in every area in how we evaluate sources, how we navigate the maze. Uh, clearly when we are born, uh, that kind of knowledge we do not have. And hopefully as we get older, the glass of knowledge really um, improves. Uh, I will not conclude with everything I talked about, uh, but I will conclude with the three W's that the, the CDC and the WHO uh, encourage us to do during this pandemic. Uh, you probably heard about it. Uh, and um, I would like to thank you for being here, for taking the time to be here. And um, I will probably stop sharing my screen and would love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Magdalene. That was really great. I think it's, um like we talked about in the beginning, really applicable to trying to not just make sense of the current pandemic, but sifting through a lot of different scientific information. So I think it's applicable in a lot of different scenarios. I was thinking maybe Deanne, if you would like, you could ask his question now, but the floor is open too to anybody else. If you want to answer a question in the chat, um, please feel free for some time.
So um, I, I know there was a long chat uh, post, so I'm just going to make this super short. I think you're right that um, industry sponsor trials are more likely to produce results that are um, positive for the industry. And I think there have been really well documented um, uh, meta-analysis to show that. I think something like three times more likely to get positive results if it's industry sponsor. Um, and I suspect that um, you know some of some of the psychology behind it is probably really subtle. Um, you know, uh, you're getting paid. It's the same kind of motivation as to why giving someone a gift, um, especially in, you know, um, with physicians getting stuff from pharmaceutical companies, um, it does produce a slight nudge for them to behave in a way that's positive to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but that kind of nudging, I think, exists um, within and without um, pharmaceutical industries. Uh, you know, we all operate on the basis of being motivated by incentives. So if incentives skew our studies because it produced biased results in, um, in industry-sponsored trials, why wouldn't the same phenomenon occur when it's not industry-sponsored, where there are incentives like, um, you know, I'm more likely to get published if I come up with novel results, or that replication studies are less likely to get published, or, you know, whatnot. And those subtle um, forces might still be at play. So I wonder uh, whether singling out industry sponsored trials um, give us the false impression that non-industry sponsored trials are somehow hmm. um, necessarily cleaner. Good point. Do you have an answer? Um, yeah. It's very was... interesting, yes, what you're asking. Yes, yes, because I did focus on the funding and who says that, uh, you know, I mean, especially in academia where you publish or perish, uh, yes, that is an issue. And I know you, you talked in your talk about a lot of people don't want to do replication. So you said that you have an answer. I would like to hear from you. Oh, that's, that's a whole other... <laughs> Another presentation? Whole other presentation, whole All other right. seminar. But, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, um, I think we are, we are incentive-driven creatures. So um, that's a lot of pressure for, I think, researcher to produce results that are good for their career, like it or not. I think one of the, the, one of the critical things about philosophy of science in the last 40 years or so after Tom Kuhn spoke is the recognition that scientists are people, they pay bills, and that's got to affect the way that we do science. Oh, I'm thinking as you, I mean, I might not have all the answers. Uh, what comes? to my mind quickly is that I, I'm, think, I'm thinking about the study. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. Uh, I think in your case, I agree with you, there could be bias a lot for academics, but if we think about the study with Coca-Cola, here's what happens. Yes, the, the, those who publish it, they have the incentive, whether they are paid by uh, private industry or anything else that would you know, reward them academically, but Coca-Cola has something else. They can sell Coca-Cola to 7 billion people. That is, a, to me, it's a huge difference. That is the difference be, to me between private companies. They, their incentive is they be, themselves being willing to do that. There's a lot of incentive there. It does not compare. Yes, the, the, peop, the authors have different uh, reasons why they do it. But the fact that Coca-Cola or other companies, there is not the only one. I just, I, I really wanted to choose one. They have, uh, Coca-Cola was very, uh, it's very famous for doing this in the last decade with uh, the soda. So I tried to find one, but you are absolutely correct. But I see the incentive for private industry, huge reward, huge. When you, you, you sell Coca-Cola to everyone in the, on the planet. Not yeah, only think, the academics. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. But I can imagine, say, like a surgeon doing a study for a, um, for a procedure that she performs clinically, and it pays a great deal of the clinic's bill. And if the study <laughs> yeah. comes out as not being therapeutically beneficial, yeah. you, uh, you, know, you cut off a major yes. stream of yes. income. Yes. Yeah, that is a personal incentive. Yes, I, absolutely. Thank you. That was great. Looks like we have another question um, from Joanne Doucette who asked, what about drug companies whose fund studies to get drugs approved when others do not know about the substance that is being developed? 
Interesting question, Joanne. Um, hmm, I don't think I have an opinion. I, I want to go on facts, not on opinions here. Uh, maybe somebody in the audience who uh, does a lot of research with drugs might be able to answer the question. Uh, I, maybe, I don't know if this is useful, but you know, this is why phase four trials, we call them trials, although they are really mm. observational studies of claims, databases, and electronic health records. That's why they come very handy once the drug is approved in the market by the FDA and everybody starts taking it and then they start uh, seeing adverse events that were not uh, seen in a phase three trial because a phase three trial is not powered to show adverse events usually. Uh, and sometimes, in some instances, the drugs are uh, withdrawn from the market when, when they see that. Hi, this is Mario Otto. Also, um, just even in the phase three clinical trials that, that are done to get the drug approved, there's usually outlined in the methods the specific ethics that go into it that describe things such as how the um, only investigators, you know, had complete control of the trial and the the, um, the company, you know, didn't have any influence on the data or what was published. There, there's certain verbiage that, that makes it pretty clear that it was the investigators that were controlling the data and, and writing the paper. And so you, you just, just something when, you, when you're reviewing the methods, you can see that. This is Alyssa Siegel. Uh, the other thing to understand about the phase three trials are they really tightly control the population that's enrolled, which is also why they may not detect some of the adverse effects or issues that occur when it's done in a ge more generalized population, such as with the phase four trials. You still do need to evaluate who potentially funding those phase four trials because some of them are still industry funded um, or actually analyzed by statisticians that are employed by the companies. So make sure that you do that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have drawn the expertise of all, everybody that we have here. I actually had a question because um, you talked a lot about retractions and uh, sort of a lot of cases where we see sort of malevolence, especially when we're talking about the autism study. But sometimes, like Deanne was saying, scientists are human and we make mistakes. Um, and obviously, when that happens, we want the we want people to you know either um, do addendums or errata or in extreme cases uh, retract it. But sometimes I worry that the incentives aren't necessarily there to do that because when when you have to do an errata, when you have to do a retraction it makes it sort of look like people associate that the same thing as some sort of malevolent thing that you did, but not necessarily it was because of just an honest mistake, but really we wanna encourage people to admit when they do something wrong. Do you have any ideas about how maybe some elements of the system could be changed to make it so that incentive, you know, that it's mm. not a bad thing that's seen as, because really it's a good thing when you, when you do that. I mean, making a mistake isn't good, but, but being upfront about it is, is good. I mean, when that happens, this is why Dean brought it up, uh, you know, and that's what happened with the uh, Wakefield paper in 98 uh, replication. And I think when these kind of errors happen, unless you can replicate the, the study, I I'm not too sure how else, that's, that's the only thing that comes to my mind. Uh, and th that would probably correct it. And what's interesting here that uh, you mentioned about, you know, things change. And one of my uh, interests that I had always was into consumer health and nutrition. And I remember uh, I, when I started to work on my PhD and we looked at Alzheimer, I looked very close. I worked very closely with a neuroscientist who was the first one who absolutely opened my mind about um, uh, all sorts of issues and chemicals in foods. And I see since then, you know, when I look at uh, articles, if you look at what happens to butter, margarine, eggs, eat no eggs, coffee, no coffee. I mean, it is constantly changing. And the reality is it takes a very long time. You need a long, very long time to be able to have good studies. You need controls, you need confounding uh, assess. So things change and they are rapidly moving, it's true. So to answer your questions, uh, I can think of replication. Maybe somebody else has some other ideas. Well, thank you again. I think this was a really great presentation. Um, as with all the other ones, this will be posted online, rec um, the recording of it. And um, I uh, put the invitation out to other faculty members if you're interested in, in presenting. I really encourage it. I think there's a lot of expertise and it's really, it's great. And uh, this has been getting a lot of good attention. Um, 
So like I said, there's no none that are scheduled right now, but there definitely will be some coming down the pipeline. So check that website link that I sent out and then also just be on the lookout for your emails. Um, so thank you everybody and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I will share my reference files. It will be posted on the uh, MCPHS page under COVID where we have the webinars uh, posted. So information will go there also. So thank you everyone.